Okay, so now that we've looked at the gross anatomy of bones with the homatop homatopoietic tissue, and next what we're going to do is we're going to look at the external markings that are found on bones. So bone markings are the bumps and lumps and divots and things that stick out on bones that are essentially um, all of the external markings. And the point of these external markings are to be able to give you sites for connections, so like your tendons and your muscles and your ligaments. But they also um, form little conduits and divots for blood vessels and nerves to run through. So bone markings are really, really important. Um, so there's a couple terms that we're going to talk about. And there are three major types of markings that you will find on the outside of bones, on the external surface of bones. The first one is going to be projections. And anytime you see a projection, it's going to be a bulge. This is an outward bulge of a bone. So if this were going to be my epiphyses and my diaphyses of my long bone, um, that was really bad. So we're going to try that again. So rather than looking like this, if I have a pro projection, it's going to bump out that way. You can also have a depression, which is going to be essentially a divot or a groove-like cutout. So if this was my bone, it would be this guy right here, where it's going to be a depression. And this is where um, nerves and blood vessels can pass through. And then a lot of your bones will actually have openings, and these are going to be holes. And these are going to allow for a passageway through the bones. So those are the three major types of bone marking um, that you will find. It comes up primarily when you're going to do lab and you're doing the naming of all the bones. But here's a short cheat sheet of all of those. Okay, so all of that was the gross anatomy of a bone. So the next section is going to be the microscopic anatomy of bone. So we're going to go a step deeper. And then after the microscopic anatomy of bone, we're going to look at the chemical composition of bone. So we're going to go even deeper. So we're kind of going backwards down the structural hierarchy. So from gross anatomy to microscopic anatomy, what this is going to focus on is the five major cell types in our bone. So there are five major cell types, and they're all going to be a specialized, but they're all going to start with the same basic cell type. So here's our five types right here, and we're going to break them down. So the first cell type is going to be an osteogenic cell. So again, remember, we've already actually talked about this. Osteo means anything bone. Genic means production, creation, synthesis. So this is going to be a mitotically active stem cell. So this is the cell that will produce new bone cells. So it is actually going to be found in quite a few places. It is found in the periosteum, and it's going to be found in the endosteum. So these are the connective tissues that will cover the inside and the outside of bones. So it'll be found in the periosteum and the endosteum of your membranes. It's going to be kind of a flattened, the structure of this will be a flattened, kind of a squamous shape. And the reason we have these osteogenic cells is that they will then differentiate, which essentially means become. They will become or they will turn into something else. So they will differentiate into osteoblasts. So your osteogenic cell will differentiate and become an osteoblast. So that is going to be really, really, really important. So with this osteogenic, some becoming osteoblast, and it'll just be a small percent will stay as osteogenic in order to produce more new stem cells. But in general, an osteogenic cell becomes an osteoblast. So these are a pro genitor cell. So it's going to produce more. Remember, they're mitotically active here, and they will differentiate into osteoblast. Okay, so this is really, really important. Your next type of cell, so we're just going to draw a little arrow, because your osteogenic cell becomes an osteoblast, guess what our second type of cell is? 
an osteoblast. So it's going to progress in this manner. Osteo, and remember, blast is going to be anything that is a um, immature form of a cell. So these are actually going to be a bone forming cell. So we are producing bone with the cell. And they are going to produce bone because they are going to secrete the extracellular matrix that is so important in connective tissue. So this osteoblast is going to secrete matrix. It is also going to be highly, highly actively mitotic. So you're going to be producing a lot of these guys. Remember, mitotic means it goes through mitosis, so it means it has a nucleus, which means it has cell division and it can create more of itself. So osteoblasts are highly actively mitotic. And these are actually really, really important because they will secrete the matrix that will surround a cell that is going to be called the osteoid. This is really, really, really important right here. So with our osteoblast, they're going to secrete the matrix called the osteoid. And what they're also gonna do with this is they're gonna be mainly responsible for bone growth. So because they produce the osteoid and because they are actively mitotic, an osteoblast is responsible for the actual growth of our bones. So that's really, really important when we get to why our bones do this. So here's an example of a, the flat squamous cell and then our osteoblast. Okay, so what's interesting is that our, up here, I'm going to add one more note to this, our osteoblasts are going to essentially be the cell that looks like this, and they're going to secrete this matrix outside. And as they secrete this matrix, they will essentially surround themselves with it. So what will happen with an osteoblast is an osteoblast will become an osteocyte. And the reason it will become an osteocyte is because it will be completely surrounded by matrix. So essentially this little cell can produce matrix and it will um, essentially secrete it all the way around it until the matrix is covering the entire outside and hardens and then that osteoblast can't do anything else. So when it surrounded by matrix completely, it will then become an osteocyte. That's important because what is our next type of cell? The next type of cell we're going to have is going to be an osteocyte. So our three types of cells so far turn into the next one. So an osteocyte, as a reminder, osteo, site means cell. So this is going to be considered the mature bone cell. So when you're talking about a mature bone cell, it's going to be an osteocyte. These are no longer dividing, so there is no more mitosis happening. No division. This cell is just what it is. No more reproduction. And it's really going to be responsible for monitoring and maintaining the bone's shape. It's going to do a lot of things. So it's going to be really important for just being the mature structure of a bone. Okay, unfortunately, bone type 4 and 5 do not uh, build on, each of, on top of each other. But we do have two more types of cells. So the next type of cell is going to be called a bone lining cell. And a bone lining cell is essentially going to be just found on the surface of the bone. It's lining the bone. So it's in the name. So a bone lining cell is going to be on the surface. And it's going to be where there is not remodeling occurring. So this is a term we'll talk about when we get to the latter half of this chapter, um, where remodeling, let me just rephrase that, where bone remodeling is not occurring. This is where you will actually find these bone lining cells. <clears throat> So this is a flat cell. It's going to help maintain the matrix, and it will actually line the internal, and it will line the external. So when it lines the internal, it will be called a periosteal cell because that's the periosteum, remember? Sorry, when it lines the external because the periosteum is the connective tissue around the outside of the bone, 
The periosteal cell is found in the periosteum. It will also line the internal. So instead of the periosteal cell, these will be the endosteal cell. Because remember, the endosteum lines the inside. So if you're trying to remember about which one is which, look at the name. Peri means upon, endo means in. So this is the fourth type of cell that you need to know. And then the fifth type of cell is a very interesting type of cell. And this is going to be the osteoclast. So an osteoclast is going to be located at places along your bone where you're going to have something called bone resorption. And so it will be located at areas where you will have this bone resorption. And that is essentially, again, going to be a process we're going to talk about in a little bit when we talk about bone remodeling. But bone resorption and bone remodeling are going to be de dealing with healing and producing new and fixing and growing new bone, all of those pieces. So an osteoclast is going to be involved with that. So it's going to be wherever there is resorption occurring. So that's really important for these guys. They're essentially going to be responsible for breaking down any bone and then resorbing. So think about it kind of as like a resorption. Um, they're going to reabsorb, resorb um, any broken down bone. So they're pretty much going to be kind of a macrophage that will then clean up bone. So that's the five types of bone cells. You can see the comparison with the last three there. And here's an image of an osteoclast. I will not be showing that on an exam, so you don't really need to know this. Okay, so that was the five types of bone cells, but we have two types of bone. So when we're looking at our compact bone, this is the microscopic anatomy of our compact bone. So as we're looking at this, we're taking our big long bone and breaking it up into um, slices that we can see underneath the microscope. So it is going to consist of these three parts that we're going to break down. So the biggest part, the overall arching part, is going to be the ostean. You may also see it as a Habershon system. That's an older name, but you still may come across that. So essentially, a Haverston system is going to be made up of something called an osteon. And this is going to be the structural unit of compact bone. So compact bone is going to be made up. This is the Lego building block of our compact bone. It's going to be called an osteon. Essentially, what an osteon is, is it's an elongated cylinder that is going to be parallel to the axis of the bone. So that means if this is my long, my epiphyses and my diaphyses, because remember it's a long bone, there's going to be this long slender cylinder inside that is running along the same axis of my body. It does not go perpendicular it runs in the same direction. So this long elongated cylinder. What's cool about this cylinder, it was actually going to be a group of hollow tubes put together. So if you've ever done a camping cup where you have put a bunch of these tubes together, essentially here is my one long tube and he is gonna look like this. Inside this other tube, it's gonna be a straw. Inside this straw, it's going to be a toothpick. So it's a group of hollow tubes that are all put together, but they're all going to be essentially stacked inside of each other. So within each of these group of hollow tubes, these guys are going to be called lamellae. So looking at right here to go back to our osteon, it's the structural unit of bone and it's an elongated cylinder. So what we're now going to talk about is that it will consist of several rings called lamellae. So essentially, all of these tubes right here are called our lamellae. So when you put these different cylinders together, it's going to be a ring. And inside these rings, these lamellae are going to have a structure that's very cool. They will contain collagen fibers. And these collagen fibers 
run in different directions. So they're not all going to be north-south, and they're not all going to be east-west. So if I have my hollow tube right here, these collagen fibers are going to run this way. Whereas my next tube has collagen fibers that are going to run this way. You'll notice they don't run in the same direction. And then my next one is going to have collagen fibers that run in the opposite direction direction. So they all will have these lamellae, which are going to be these collagen fibers that are going to run in different directions. And the reason you have this is because the ability to have these run in different directions are going to withstand the ability to twist this tube. So it's really, really important. So you can kind of see that I have drawn this guy right here. So you can see how that is structured with all of the different lines going in different directions. Okay, so that's a single osteon. If you take that osteon, what you'll actually notice is that if you take that osteon <clears throat> and you turn it on its side and you look at it, so this is looking at it on the side, but if you do it straight on, what you'll also see is that it will look like, we'll just do it right here, this. So it, here's one tube, Here's my second tube. Here's my third tube. So if we take these guys right here, one tube, second tube, third tube, you are essentially, if you look at it straight on, you're gonna see kind of like the hollows of a trunk or the hollows of a ring. So that's really, really cool. So this next section, as we're talking about the canals and can caniculi, these are gonna run through the core of this osteon. So when we're actually looking at our canals, what we're doing with our, these guys are going to be tubes that are going to allow things to run through our bone. So there's two types of canals. You will have a central canal, which is going to run through the center of the osteon. So if I'm looking at it in this direction, this guy right here is going to be my central canal. It's the middle ring of the trunk. Another type of canal you're going to have is called a perforating canal. And a perforating canal is going to be at a right angle. And if it's at a right angle, it'll be the right angle to the axis of the bone. So these perforating canals are going to do like this and go through the axis of the bone. So those are the two different types of canals you will have. And the goal for both of these is to be able to have blood fibers and nerve fibers be able to um, connect inside and outside of these bones. So central and perforating, Haversham is an old name. Volkmans is also an old name, but this will run through and this will be at right angles to the central canal. Okay, so that's that. When you also look at this on the um, straight down as the cross section, you're going to have a couple other things. So here is my lovely little central canal. Here is my one cylinder of lamellae. Here is my second cylinder of lamellae. Here is my third. Well, let me redo that one. Here is my third cylinder of my lamellae. So when we're looking at these lamellae, in between there are these little tiny hollow sections between each lamellae layer. So these are going to be lacunae. So these lacunae are hollow junctions that are going to be found between your lamellae layers. And what's important about these is they're going to be filled with osteocytes. So remember, osteocytes are the mature bone cell that is not actively dividing, but it is maintaining the structure of the cell. So whenever you have these lovely little sections right here, you will have your lacunae right there. Okay, that's where you will have your osteocytes. 
So the other section that you're going to have is you're going to have tiny little canals, tiny little, tiny, 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 branching little canals. These are not the same as the perforating canals. But these are going to be tiny, tiny, tiny little canals, so little that they're actually not going to be called a full canal. They are called a caniculi, which is kind of like a baby canal. And so these are going to be hair-like canals that are going to connect lacunae to each other. So they will connect the lacunae and they will connect it to the central canal. So these are not a full canal, they are a tiny little hair-like canal. And what's important about this caniculi is that as these osteoblasts are going to secrete bone ma matrix and essentially create a osteocyte, because that's what happens, the matrix will harden all the way around the cell and you're going to get them stuck into this layer that will be happening. So it's a very cool process of how your osteocytes are produced. And then you have two more things. You have something called an interstitial um, and a circumferential lamellae. So lamellae is the layers. So everything that we've drawn so far has looked like this. Layer one, layer two, layer three. So these are my three tubes that are put inside each other. So when we're looking at this interstitial lamellae, <clears throat> These are all going to be the ones that are around and make up my osteon, but our osteon are not only one osteon per bone. Remember, these are the building block. These are the Legos. So there's a lot of osteons put together. So I'll have one osteon there. I'll have one osteon there. And then I'll make a third osteon that is here. So what you're actually going to have is this thing called an interstitial lamellae which is going to fill the gaps between osteons. So it will look like, here's my osteon, I'm gonna get bigger, oh wait, there's my osteon. Now we're gonna do this, and we're gonna do this, and now we're gonna do this, and we're going to connect. So these interstitial lamellae are gonna be this guy right here where they are not fully around the osteon, but they are essentially creating and connecting the osteons. And then you also have a different osteon called a circumferential osteon. And a circumferential osteon, so if this is our microscopic anatomy of our bone, so in order to do this picture, we took our long bone like this, and we chopped it right here, and then we looked straight down. So that's how we got to this. But now if we take our epiphysis and we do this, a circumferential osteon is actually going to be where you are going to have the layers around the whole thing. So it'll be the width of the actual um, entire diaphysis. So if we come down here and look, these guys real quick, this is the easiest way to describe it. Here is the osteon right here. So this is going to be one osteon. You'll notice here is my lamellae. So here is my layer one, layer two, layer three. So you can see that right now with your lamellae. But then what you can see is right here. I'm just going to highlight it. Here is my osteon. Here is my osteon. You can see right here in between all of these guys is where I will have my circum my inferential interstitial lamellae. But what we're talking about right now is going to be our circumferential lamellae, which is these guys. So they are going around the entire width of the diaphysis ship, um, shaft. So they're going all the way around the outside. So that's what is happening with the microscopic anatomy of your um, compact bone. So now we're going to switch gears and just do quickly the microscopic anatomy of spongy bone. So you'll notice it's not super, super complex and we've already talked a lot about it. So the microscopic anatomy of spongy bone. So as you study for this class, 
make sure what you're doing is identifying if the question is asking about spongy or compact, because those are very different. Ask about if it's asking about connective tissue or skeletal bone. Look and see, are we asking about gross anatomy, microscopic anatomy, or chemical composition? Because that's going to be small, medium, and large perspective. So the big thing here is just read the questions to make sure you understand the specific details that the question is asking. So right now, this is the microscopic anatomy of spongy bone. This is going to look poorly organized, but it's actually going to be not. So spongy bone will have the structures that we've already talked about, which are going to be the trabiculae. And the trabiculae are going to allow for the bone to have a very high strength and to be strong. So that's really, really, really important. Within the, the spongy bone, there is no osteon. So this entire process we just talked about does not exist in a spongy bone. It is only going to be the trabiculae. So you'll notice right here, here's our layer of spongy with our top layer and our bottom layer of compact. And here are our trabiculae. No osteon here. Okay, so now the last part we're going to talk about is going to be the chemical composition of bone. So this is the smallest um, level we're going to talk about when it comes to the skeletal system. Chemical composition of bone. And there's a few important features here. So chemical composition of bone is going to be made up of both organic and inorganic components. So flash back all the way to chapter two and try and remember what the organic and the inorganic components are. So when we're talking about organic components, we're going to start with that. All organic components that make up the um, types of bone are going to be, first off, all five cell types. Because all five cell types have a plasma membrane, have a nucleus, have a mitochondria, have normal operating functional cellular functions. Those are going to require carbon, which by definition makes it organic. So all five cell types, which are osteogenic, osteoblast, osteocytes, osteoclasts, and the bone lining cell, and then the osteoid itself. So that is going to be the all five cell types and the osteoid. The osteoid is going to be made up of matrix because this is going to be highly, highly, highly make, made up of one third of the bone matrix. So matrix is secreted by the actual cell. Remember, it's a connective tissue, so it has to have that. It has to have the ground substance to be considered the matrix, and it's got to have fibers. So flashback to chapter four on connective tissue in order what makes up a connective tissue. So ground substance and fibers are made up of a matrix and your osteon will make about a third of the matrix. So it's really, really, really important. Those are the two primary things about our um, chemical components that are organic in nature. So the reason we have these organic is because the function of these guys is they're going to ha have resilience. And this resilience is going to allow for the bone to have its structure. And it's also going to allow for the bone to have its flexibility. So while it is super, super strong, it does have the ability to slightly flex. It is not just a hard structure that does not have that ability. So it has a slight flexibility to it. It's also going to um, resist twisting. And these two primary components of the cell types in the osteon are going to give the organic components that has this function for these particular reasons. Okay, we're going to switch and not do or organic components, but you have inorganic. So as a reminder, inorganic means that there is not carbon. There is not a carbon molecule in inorganic components. So some of the inorganic components are going to be mineral salts. So salts are going to be a large composition of your bone. These are going to be calcium phosphate. 
it's a two plus. I just can't write it. And phosphate. These are salts that are very, very, very important. In fact, they're so important that they are 65% of bone mass are going to be this calcium salt. So it's really, really important. And what this allows for is this allow for the bone to be super, super hard. So this will allow for the bone to be able to maintain its structural integrity and be hard. So we're getting ready to approach Halloween. Um, as we're approaching Halloween, <clears throat> skeletons are a big decoration. The reason skeletons actually exist is because the inorganic compounds, the inorganic salts, actually are responsible for the hardness. And this is why the bone will actually last after death, because the rest of your body is made up of carbon tissues. So it's an organic tissue, which will fade and decay. But your bone is primarily 65% inorganic. So it's made up of mineral salts. And because it's inorganic, it does not decay as fast. So after death, after a little bit of time, all of the organic components have um, decayed, but the inorganic components or the skeleton is still there. So that's kind of what's happening in that world and why this is happening. So you can see that here. It lasts long after death and it will cause um, because of that mineral composition. So that's really cool how that process all works.